Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. This is such a exciting moment to see all of you around the table in person. Uh, good afternoon. I am Adam Lupel, IPI uh, Vice President, and it really is um, my distinct honor to welcome you all here uh, to this uh, side event, opening the 77th United Nations General Assembly, doing aid better, actions to support local leadership and policy funding and practice, organized in partnership with USAID, Peace Direct, Civicus Near Network, uh, and the Skoll Foundation, uh, and many, many other, uh, many thanks to all of you for your, for your great work. Um, I'll be very brief. It is um, always a pleasure to, to welcome the Minister of Power back to, to IPI. Um, those of us who have been around the UN uh, for some time, of course, remember fondly her work as US permanent representative. Uh, so welcome back. At, um, at a very busy time, we, we jumped at the opportunity to support this event because we at IPI share uh, the sense of urgency around the message. Um, we must do better uh, and we can do better. The thing is, um, we have learned over time what many of the key elements are that are required for success. Nothing is easy, but the um, lessons from research and practice are clear. Incorporating local level knowledge, gender responsive leadership, and the broad-based inclusion of civil society are key components to the successful agenda setting and implementation of policies across the triple nexus of humanitarian development and peace practice. We have a tremendous group around this table, and so I really don't want to take up any more time. Um, and uh, I think part of the goal is to hear from all of you. And so I will now quickly pass it over to our moderator, Alana Aquino, US Executive Director of Peace Direct. Uh, as many of you may know, Alana has over 15 years of experience in peace building and development including seven years in East and Southern Africa and Sudan and South Sudan, where she worked with South Sudanese uh, IDPs. And she's also currently chair of the Board of Women of Color Advancing Peace, Security and Conflict Transformation. Alana, welcome to IPI, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much, Adam. I was not expecting a, a bio introduction. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So welcome to everyone. Here, we are grateful that you were able to make time for this meeting during this very busy week. We'll now turn your attention to a short video from local development, humanitarian, and peacebuilding leaders. Locally led development it ensures that the very actors that, uh, that are affected by uh, various challenges, uh, development challenges, are at the center of the response strategies using local uh, concept approaches and mechanisms that are familiar and well understood at the grassroots level. You work for peace that the world so much needs has to be locally led. We have worked for over two decades in many of these villages, but we have seen that if peace has to be meaningful, it has to be led by local women, local groups, indigenous organizations, because that's where bulk of the world's conflict is now focused in. Why is locally led peace building important to us? There's the sustainability element. You find that most organizations employ locally and have families that are affected uh, by violent conflict. And so there's a real genuine uh, interest in seeing change come about. We believe that for inclusive development, it is imperative that the resources must be channelized and the decision making of how these resources will be implemented or allocated to an initiative must be given to the local people. Until we shift this power to the local communities, we are not able to make any impact. I'm working with the local community 22 years. Locally lead development is a very important for a jury resolutions in a community sustainable. Therefore, supporting to the local community to improve their skill and capability and leading them by themselves is more effective way to achieve objectives and goals. Local organizations like Legacy, who is working at the grassroots level to promote peaceful coexistence, do not have access to grants 
but I promise you that the only way we can prove ourselves to you is to give us the opportunity and we shall prove to you that we will not only manage your funds effectively but also efficiently thank you so much now we're going to turn to few, uh, a few of our colleagues to set the context for our conversation. These are well-known thought leaders in our field and to save time, I will not give their bios. We'll start with Lisa John, Secretary General of Civicus, then over to Samantha Power, USAID Administrator, followed by Anita Katakuri, Director of Policy at NIR. I'm gonna see if you can hear me. No, okay. Can you hear me now? Great. I, I came into New York a few days ago. I spent the first two days trying to wear a suit and formal shoes and then just gave up. Neither the roads nor the climate permit any kind of free thinking <laughs> in, in clothes that are set up for a conference environment. Uh, so I'm here and I want to start by saying I, I came off an extremely energetic and emotional event Yesterday, it was the first ever global African business initiative. And, and for me, as someone who's been, uh, you know, in the development and human rights domain for nearly three decades, I think it was the very first time I've seen a truly intergenerational, intersectional, cross-sector collaborative event where the need for, in, you know, interdependence and connectedness and to just listen to each other and, and connect with shared values was so very high. Uh, even somebody who's... Uh, an eternal skeptic like me, I think, just had to set aside a lot of my, uh, you know, kind of uh, criticism of what governments were saying or what the heads of states were uh, were presenting and really connect with the human value for cooperation and collaboration. And I think that's what the pandemic has kind of done to us, right? It's it's taken away all the layers and the masks and everything that we have and, and, and forced us to bring our authentic uh, and I think forceful selves uh, to, to any platform that we are in. So, so as I... I mean, just while, while being here, I, I do want to say how profoundly proud and grateful I am to be part of this community, which has constantly again and again and again reinvented itself uh, in the face of, you know, different aspects of change and crisis. Uh, and, and I think this is the one group that uh, never really gives up on the aspiration and the effort to make the world a more just, a more sustainable and a more honest place. And I think that's the the, the, the undertone for the dialogue here really uh, that, that I hope uh, we, we will get into. So um, there are a few things that uh, all of my allies and co-workers and peers who, especially those who've been working on uh, reinforcing and strengthening local civil society have sternly asked me to uh, present here. And I'm gonna try and be as true to their experience as possible. So it's just four very simple points which uh, seem very straightforward and, and and not complicated, but I think are more complicated and complex when in, in practice, right? Uh, so, so I'm gonna just set the easy tone and then let Anita from near take all the challenging questions and comments. Uh, so, the, so the very first thing I think was, there was a time where people were thrilled by the fact that the quality of uh, resourcing, I'm not going to say aid, of resourcing and investment in local civil society was a good thing. I think now, you know, a lot of actors that, uh, are, are around this table uh, and and uh, not here are very clear that the quality the quantity of aid simply cannot be se separated or segregated from the investment in an ecosystem that actually allows civil society to, op to operate and work and i think during the pandemic of course we're all aware that the the immense restrictions the reprisals the attacks the censure the scrutiny of civil society has just increased you know uh, multiple times and and therefore any kind of prescribed format for implementation for project delivery is not just unfavorable, it's unforgivable in this context, but because you're literally taking away the ability that civil society has to sense check its context, to understand the dangers, the risks, and the opportunities for change in their own environment, and therefore then operate with the best of themselves, right, in a, in a responsive and innovative way. Uh, and I think that that was, you know, really the first message that it, it really isn't just now about the optional way of doing things or the optional way of co-creating, it's, it's, it's really a necessity. It's, it's a life saving, it's a survival tactic for civil society to actually be able to chart its own course and choose its own issues and, and operate in a way that 
uh, the, 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 the support being received is not just for the implementation of activities, but for the creation of that support system uh, in, that we need to operate. Um, on that context, uh, we, you know, we were part of a study along with um, Agna and uh, you know, a, a few other organizations uh, on what business and government were doing well during the pandemic to support civil society. And it was very clear that there are, uh, you know, it, it's not rocket science. There are some really straightforward things that can be done in terms of system strengthening. Many of you are experts on that subject. But essentially, you know, the financial and regulatory framework really being much more enabling and, and, and it being non-negotiable. I mean, no sense of restriction should be acceptable. Uh, really creating that, um, you know, environment or incentivizing public giving and solidarity and making that a transnational uh, activity and a, a, a transnational sentiment. Uh, and, and thirdly, really, you know, the infrastructure for innovation and collaboration, whether it's the digital, the financial, the technical, means really being there. And ironically, yesterday, there was a video message from uh, President Paul Kagame in, in the Gabi event, where he said exactly the same thing, but in the context of business enterprise. So, so I mean, really, the fact is that we are willing to do that for businesses, but we're not willing to do that for civic actors. And that shouldn't really be uh, the case. Uh, the third point really is the approach and the inherent value of co-creation, uh, which really has to be something that's a cultural shift in our own institutions first, before we can actually you know, convey that to our partners and our allies. And I think really making sure that people walk the talk of the policy, of the leadership statements. Uh, I know that we have two initiatives, uh, which is the Grassroots Solidarity uh, Revolution and the Youth Action Lab, which are examples of many other spaces where that, you know, the, those courageous conversations are happening where we really challenge uh, hierarchy, where we challenge entrenched notions of colonization, uh, and, and, and discrimination and, and are really able to get ahead of that. And then the last thing uh, I'd really like to say is that emphatically localization is not a game of, the no of Northern civil society versus Southern civil society. It is local civil society in every context that needs to be supported. I think we're very, very aware that when political will changes for support to civil society, it is local civil society in the global North that defends the space that is needed that defends the investments that's needed for civil society around the globe. So, uh, I mean, definitely we don't want to be in that kind of competition for resources. Rather, it, it's an investment. It's it's a it's an understanding that uh, a, a fully networked, a fully resourced, and a fully empowered civil society is a transnational national entity and 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 is a global good that we really cannot do without. So, I'll, I'll end there. Great. Okay. Thank you so much uh, for those uh, powerful ideas. Um, and uh, let me just, just say at the outset that I think um, the inextricable link that you have drawn between uh, resources and policy and, and legal frameworks um, that is too often, too often missed or neglected, and and certainly, it's something that I think the Biden administration is very alert to, um, and it's just very important that everywhere around the world, that that is lived in our engagements with with host governments, um, which I'm sure, of course, is not not always the case. Um, uh, I want to thank all the leaders who are participating here today, um, and I feel humbled to be among you and really eager uh, to learn. Thanks to Peace Direct uh, for hosting this discussion, and it is great to be back at the International Peace Institute. I'm thinking about this room and all the Security Council informal meetings we had where nothing was achieved. Um, so this is going to be uh, much more productive, I suspect. Um, and for those of you who live and are based in New York, I'm sorry for your commute. Uh, uh, this is the first in several years and people had forgotten how much they loved the UN General Assembly in New York City, I suspect. Um, so again, I'm, I'm looking forward to listening, uh, but did wanna share a little bit my experience uh, since coming to USAID uh, more than a year and a half ago. Um, so upon arriving, and of course, always being a champion of um, more space for, for civil society or non-negotiable space for civil society and, and uh, being very concerned by the uh, democratic backsliding and the creativity of 
repressive regimes using financial and regulatory and other tools. Nonetheless, you know, running a large aid agency is a different uh, piece of business. Um, and from the very earliest days, I heard from civil society groups like NEAR, Civicus, current and former USAID leadership and staff, particularly, I wanna stress this, USAID's local staff, more than 70% of our teams around the world uh, are nationals of the countries in which we work. They are the engineers, the economists, the public health professionals. Many of them have worked with USAID for uh, a decade or two. Uh, and really our Foreign Service National Empowerment Agenda, I think is inextricably linked to our localization agenda, which I'll come to. Talking with other governments, several of which are re represented here, uh, who have robust foreign assistance programs, philanthropic funders, and of course our implementing partners. So learning and and uh, but one of the things I heard just across the board um, consistently from from all, irrespective of where they sat, uh, was that there is a better way to do foreign assistance or foreign resourcing. I like that. Um, there is a model of uh, resourcing development that tilts the balance of power away from funders toward the communities in which we work, uh, a model that prizes the knowledge of people in those communities, respects their expertise, expertise and engages them as partners rather than as beneficiaries a model that elevates the voices of marginalized populations that are too often ignored or excluded. That model is one we call locally led inclusive development and core to it is creating the space for those with ideas, leadership and credibility to drive change in their own communities. Back in November, after this wide consultation, I unveiled two targets at USAID designed to propel our agency in a more inclusive direction. First, by 2025, USAID will provide at least a quarter of all our program funds directly to local partners. I know that does not seem like a very large number, but it is a very large leap uh, for USAID. Ramping up the percentage of funds that go to development partners from countries where we work has long been an ambition, as many of you know, of previous USAID administrators. And in all honesty, as you also know, it has been a stubborn target to move in real life. But we are taking uh, what I think are creative new steps to get there. And I'd love to hear from you today about other things you think we should be doing. Last November, we unveiled our Central America Local Initiative, which sets aside $300 million over five years specifically to invest in organizations based in Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala to generate locally led progress in the region. We exceeded our targets for awards to local partners during the first year of this initiative. And in just one recent example, last week, our mission in Honduras launched a new $4 million activity with a Honduran civil society organization aimed at rooting out corruption, which of course is crucial work in the region and in so many other parts of the world. Based on what we've learned in Central America, today I'm announcing a new similar regional approach in Sub-Saharan Africa, the Africa Localization Initiative. Working together with our partners in Congress, we intend to set aside funding exclusively to work with local organizations across the continent and elevate their leadership as we work to achieve shared goals. We'll be announcing more details about this initiative in future months, but we are excited about the new partnerships it will generate. While directly funding community-based actors is a critical aspect of shifting ownership, it doesn't fully capture what it means to shift power. We need to break down barriers so that local communities can exercise their own leadership. That's the spirit behind the second goal I announced last November, that at least half of all of our programs will create space for local communities to determine their own development priorities, manage the design and implementation of the work, or measure its results. This isn't going to happen on its own. We need to engage with a much larger group of partners than ever before, from small businesses and entrepreneurs to marginalized and underrepresented communities. And we need to listen to their expertise. Putting this into practice could be 
uh, as simple as translating USAID solicitations into local languages so more organizations can apply, or it can be as complex as infusing local customs and expertise into our programs. For instance, our partners in Guatemala's Western Highlands are using traditional Mayan healing practices and local traditions of emotional recovery to help survivors recover from sexual, gender-based, and domestic violence. To support progress toward both of our targets, we're building on past efforts and making a series of policy, organizational, and behavioral changes that should make USAID more accessible and responsive to new partners and local communities. One of the most important steps we can take is reconsidering our posture toward risk. As USAID has consistently demonstrated, we take seriously our responsibility to the American people as good stewards of taxpayer dollars. But working with new players, by definition, comes with new risks. To be frank, there is a risk in any kind of partnership. And working with established partners who know the ins and outs of USAID risks, uh, of USAID, excuse me, risks missing out on opportunities where we could be supporting and elevating the local change makers who are best positioned to advance progress in their communities. A low appetite for risk, as traditionally understood, can stifle new ways of working. So we revised our agency-wide risk appetite statement to reflect a broader conception of risk, clarifying that we do in fact have a high appetite for taking smart and disciplined risks in working with local partners, which we know will lead to more equitable and sustainable development outcomes over time. We also have to be more accessible to local partners, contending with jargon-filled paperwork and navigating a slew of bureaucratic processes is not realistic for smaller organizations with fewer resources and small staffs. Often it's hard for local organizations to even know where to begin. So we've developed tools to make it easier to work with USAID. Last November, we relaunched, we launched, excuse me, a website very creatively named called Work With USAID. <laughs> it's our one-stop shop for clear and easy to access information about funding and partnership opportunities. Since its launch last year, almost 3,000 organizations have registered in Work With USAID's partner directory, more than half of them local partners, a majority of whom we have never worked with before. Feedback on workwithusaid.gov uh, is welcome, by the way. Getting folks to the front door is one thing, but we're also working to streamline our processes where possible, including allowing applicants for funding to submit brief concept notes including in languages other than English, radical though that sounds, <laughs> rather than requiring full-blown applications up front. And for full applications, we're exploring options to translate local language submissions into English. We're also encouraging the use of mechanisms that pay for results, allowing organizations to focus less on our requirements and more on development outcomes. And next month, we will release a new first of its kind local capacity strengthening policy, which lays out a shared vision for how we can support the goals and priorities of locally based partners, building on their existing strengths. While I'm hopeful about the ways these reforms will change our agency and our relationships with local partners, we are just one partner and we are really just at the start of this multi-year process. To make a measurable dent in reforming the development community for the better, it will require staying power on our part and tangible actions by everyone, not just in this room or watching on the live stream, but in this field. We will continue to make these reforms uh, and to work toward our targets, but we really hope that the entire development community continues to take steps alongside us so we can learn together. Whether that's donors changing the way we do business or local partners helping to hold us to account. Like I said, though, I'm here today to listen, so I'm excited to hear your perspectives and understand the ways in which we can all embrace this new model of locally led inclusive development. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, it's a hard one to come off of. Um, on behalf of NEAR and NEAR members, sincere thanks to IPI and Peace Direct, uh, the 
Pelton Foundation, Skoll Foundation, um, USAID, Civicus, uh, for organizing an event very much at the heart of NIR's mission. I, um, and for Administrative Powers, your announcement, I know NIR members are going keenly interested in the Africa Localization Initiative and will be following next steps closely. For those not familiar, NIR is a network uh, of Global South civil society organizations aiming to reinvent aid. At the moment, we have 150 NGO members and we partner with networks um, all over the world to reach hundreds more. NIR members are on the front line of spiraling humanitarian crises, climate change, and new challenges to development. As just one example, uh, before traveling here, I spoke with Mohammed Ahmad, chair of the National Humanitarian Network, the NHN in Pakistan, about the devastating floods in the country, covering one third of the country and an estimated 2000 people have passed, more than $30 billion worth of damages. This is a man-made crisis, but it wasn't entirely made in Pakistan. Ahmad told me that despite best efforts to prepare, reality is the climate crisis caused also by wealthy countries and companies has overwhelmed his country's preparedness efforts and destroyed communities. The neat bureaucratic distinctions that we make between climate justice, humanitarian action, development and disaster risk reduction are, are just not standing up to the reality in Pakistan. Pakistani NGOs understand this, and they are everywhere doing everything they can. Every day, NHN members and Pakistani NGO leadership work around the clock with every dollar in their hands available and every staff person available focused on relief efforts. All the while, new money for the response is tied up in forms and processes first to be received by UN agencies and INGOs, and then maybe in two or three months time, some lucky Pakistani NGOs will get enough money to pay for the, for example, food that they've been distributing, but not enough for laptops or an office or the salary of their leadership, executive director after programs have finished. Ahmad told me that NHN members will likely exhaust the resources that they are spending, their current ex resources, in the next six to eight weeks. For NIR, doing aid better is about listening to these people, Global South leaders, and ensuring that they have the resources that they need to address the challenges their communities are facing now and in the future. Doing aid better is trusting that local and national NGOs are reliable, professional, and efficient, central to effective humanitarian response and sustainable development. In this room, we have many, made many great commitments to support, or many have made, not in this room, many, <laughs> many have made great commitments to support local and national NGOs as individual agencies or collectively, like in the Grand Bargain, um, but a step change in commitment has yet to lead to a step change in practice, not just in Pakistan, in Bangladesh, Myanmar, South Sudan, Somalia, I could go on. And in each of these contexts, since commitments have been made, near members have expected a different approach and been left disappointed and frustrated. I truly do applaud the vision that Administrator Powers has, has set out. And um, we know the ambitious and worthy targets you've mentioned, the 25%, the 50%. Our members were, were really encouraged by your announcement in November. As you read in the letter, I think that 1,289 12, Global South Civil Society leaders signed. We are hoping that these commitments mark a new turning point. But how this vision, not just for USAID, the localization vision that we have in the sector, the locally led development vision is implemented is all important. 
how it's implemented is all important. I'm gonna say this again. And here, the devil is in the details, or as my le colleagues like to say, the process is as important as the outcome. If your localization efforts allow for private contractors and INGOs to reinvent themselves as local entities, we won't make progress. If you want to show localization results quickly, but don't have time to listen to local leaders on what is necessary, desirable, or possible, we won't make progress. If your funding is administrated so that only a select few national organizations are able to access those resources, we won't make progress. What we need as next steps is to not lose sight of the 25 commitment many of you have made and make sure that this goes to truly local actors. Set national level targets in countries and monitor regularly that progress because if it's not tracked, it won't get done. And we need to make sure that this money reaches those it's intended to. We also need to invest in the establishment of locally led funding mechanisms that can receive high volumes of funding and manage those resources effectively. A good example of this is in the Bolsho Fund in Somalia, which has developed a pipeline of community verified initiatives that need funding, created an in-house grant making service and developed strong management around the whole. Amongst others we know, near members in Myanmar and Nepal are working to set up similar mechanisms, but we need donor long-term investment to make these strong and sustainable. And we need to invest in the coordination of NGOs at national and subnational levels so that networks like NHN in Pakistan or CRGR in Central America or the Indonesian Development Humanitarian Alliance can do more and better for their communities. Localization, locally led development is systems change and national NGO networks are essential part of aid systems. So reflecting also on some of Lisa's points, I, as I close, I wholeheartedly agree. I think localization is more than just funding. But even as we work towards the long-term changes needed uh, for shifting power and leadership in the sector, let's prioritize shifting funding into the hands of local leaders. Thank you for the time. Thank you all. We're now going to turn to Don Gibbs, CEO of the Skoll Foundation to begin a conversation of what this looks like in action before we go to a wider discussion. First of all, it's unfair to make me go after these incredible speakers. Uh, and it's wonderful to be with so many esteemed colleagues in this room. When I served as ambassador in South Africa, I learned an expression that I love for occasions like this, all protocols observed. Uh, um, you know, I am so excited to be here and Administrator Power came and spoke at our, or virtually spoke, unfortunately couldn't come in person, to our Skull World Forum uh, last April. And in a very short sentence, she captured what we're about here. Nothing about us without us. And I think it's core to where we are trying to go, both at Skull, where our value is, we trust those closest to the problem, to the challenge, to lead the change. So we've centered equity in our work. We believe that it's critical. I've seen this firsthand. I worked with a group called Sarvodia in Sri Lanka, a locally led driven initiative when I was 22. And I saw the knowledge of the culture, the knowledge of the problems and how it translated into impact. I saw it again when I served as ambassador and saw the difference between groups who were rooted in the country and those that came from the outside. But let me tell you, the barriers and having served in government to being able to fund local and Ambassador Power talked, or sorry, Administrator, you've had too many titles, uh, talked about this, the risk in government of doing this, it takes courage. And what I'm so excited about is administ Administrator Power's leadership, but we got on a call with USAID and I think 
correct me, but I think Don Steinberg had 16 of the USAID colleagues on the phone. Uh, um, and Michelle has been driving this and now they've got Monde leading the Africa work. I believe this team is truly committed to these changes. And if we in philanthropy and we in civil society work with them, I think we can actually do what Anita talked about and drive that type of implementation in a way that has never happened before. And I believe that will create a multiplier on impact that is critical. And we all have to put on a different hat than we've had previously because risk will keep us from doing this. It's more work. It takes more time, as Anita said, to listen first. But I think it's critical. And I think this is the moment and I'm very excited to be here. Thank you. To piggyback off of uh, something you said, Don, um, I was at the ICAP fellowship this past week and one of the brilliant mentors and ambassador who was there said, if it's about us without us, it's not for us. So that was another version of that. So um, I'll flag two notes as we go into our discussion portion. First, I encourage us to all use first names here to foster a spirit of goodwill and shared learning. And also please forgive me in advance for any mispronunciations. <laughs> Second, a note on definitions. We note that the language is not perfect and is ever evolving as we endeavor to shift power imbalances and be more effective in our work. For example, terms such as global north and global south represent more of an academic understanding than a geographical reality. We also note that the definition of local itself needs to be very specific and consistent in order for it to be effective. Peace Direct in consultation with leading INGOs such as CRS, MCLD, Save the Children US, Oxfam and Plan International US defines local as organizations headquartered and operating in their own country. So the floor is now open to discussants. Please keep your remarks to two minutes or less. I'll be a stickler about time. I have my little timer here today to make sure we have the opportunity for robust conversation uh, with the most contributions possible. And as the speakers have given their contribution, they will be in listening mode to foster conversation amongst uh, everyone else here. You can indicate that you'd like to contribute by raising your hand, and we'll also use the two finger rule for quick reactions. So I'll pose two questions to begin. Um, in a world of upstanders and bystanders, what do you see as the main challenges and barriers to affecting change toward locally led development, humanitarian support and peace building? And how can they be addressed? And I'll tack on one other set of questions. As well, what steps need to be taken to ensure meaningful partnership where power imbalances can be addressed at all levels of interaction? In other words, how can we ensure first principles of flexibility, inclusion, respect, sustainability, and trust are woven into policy and practice. Now, uh, I will open the floor. Gunjan, would you like to kick us off? Sure. Uh, thanks, Alana. Uh, first, I do want to say that, you know, like, like Anita said, we were very excited in the movement for community-led development, which is a global consortium of over 1,500 local civil society organizations from the majority world, um, you know, and 70 INGOs. We were very excited when the announcements came in November last year. Uh, that's something that we've been talking about. You know, a lot of the things that you have talked about in terms of language access, so basic. Uh, in terms of our attitude to risk, so basic, right? and very fundamental is something we've been talking about. But Alana asked about barriers, right? And Lisa, when you started initially, you spoke to, you won't call it aid, you'll call it resourcing, right? And I think that's such an important point because we have to recognize that the biggest barrier is the fact that this system that we operate in was designed for aid, not as partnership development, not for resourcing, and it wasn't designed for local organizations, 
It's not designed for local organizations, right? And the barriers from, not just from language, but the tranche of funding, how the funding flows out, the amount of period that is given to respond to a proposal, very pragmatic everyday things, right? Anita spoke to the process being important. All of those things are part of the process. And therefore, the two goals and you know, the commitments from USAID are fantastic but they do require a systemic change, a change where you have to really focus on strengthening the local ecosystem, right? Because community-based organizations and local organizations will not be able to access the current USAID funding. And I just want to give a very quick example to that. So recently in all terms, the changes that USAID has been making, there was this fantastic call for proposals from one of the country missions which was for local organizations. And we had all the CBOs who got very excited about it. And then they went through it and they came back to us and they said, well, we don't understand. How are we supposed to even apply for this? Do we qualify? What do these terms mean? Oh, we can't, so overheads, INGOs can get 25%, 30% if they have NICRA, they can't get, right? Is it that local organizations don't have those expenses? They don't have those staff, staffing requirements? So simple things. The proposal period was about a couple of weeks for them to bring it out, to submit by the time they understood. And then it was three and four months and they never heard back. So now they don't know all the time and effort we spent, was it worth it? Did something happen? Was our application wrong because this is the first time we did it and we had to do it in English and we had to submit all these documents that were not there. So it requires a systemic change. And in terms of what this could look like, meaningful partnership, I think Anita alluded to a very important point of not just when you have to resource domestic civil society, you have to think about what are the existing mechanisms that can be strengthened. If individual CBOs are not able to access that funding, can you look at collectives of national CBOs? Can we work through them? Can we support them to do it? I think that could be an important thing. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, may I now turn to Fort Nora? <clears throat> Thank you. And good for you that you introduced the first name rule just before I introduce <laughs> me. Um, I'll give you two angles and two challenges in approximately two minutes or a little over. Um, so we work with this agenda from two angles. And the first angle is many have touched upon is it's about shifting the power or, or making global development more demand driven in a way. Um, we, um, uh, we are doing quite a lot of things to try to do that better. We're implementing mechanisms in our grant management or have done over time to do that. Uh, we are these days working a lot more with uh, knowledge partners and the research partners in, for instance, on the African continent. Uh, I mean, the African continent has approximately 12 to 13 percent of the world's population but only a bit more than 1% of the peer reviewed research globally. So that, of course, that uh, uh, has a lot to say or what the questions that are asked, the answers that are given, and we have to look for these questions specifically. The challenge here is of course that uh, you can't take away your own interests in a way. And, and like Gunjan, as I put it very well, the system is, is created for aid, not for partnership. Uh, and you can't take away Norwegian politicians' uh, legitimate uh, views or American politicians. So, so there, is, uh, there is a challenge there. The other angle is about creating capacity mostly on the ground, not mostly on a different level, uh, which is challenging to us. At our best, we've been able to do that, for instance, on, in tropical forests, the work we were doing there. We've been able to move from huge NGOs to actually managing grants and working with partners in indigenous peoples in the Amazon, in Indonesia, and so on. Um, our main challenge is, of course, that we are a small agency. Even, Nor even though Norway spends 1% of GDP and is a, is a yeah, big player in many ways compared to the size of our country, 
most agencies are not like USAID or GISAT. We are small. We, we don't implement ourselves. We will always implement mostly through the multilaterals and the NGOs. So bringing the multilaterals into this conversation uh, is essential for us to reach our goals. And the reason why we involve in this agenda, just to sum up by that, is simply because we think we will, it will provide better global development if we can localize it better. It's, you know, it's almost a universal theory of change that most decisions become better if they are taken or made closer to the people who are affected, which is another way of saying nothing about us without us. Thank you so far. Thank you. Let us go ahead then and bring in multilateral organizations, Elizabeth. Oh, great. Thank you so much. Just first of all, to say that I'm really encouraged by what I've, I've heard this afternoon about where USAID is, is going. And I think we can certainly, the big multilaterals, we can drive a lot of inspiration uh, from that. So let me just put out a few points uh, with respect to barriers and then perhaps some steps that can be taken, uh, particularly within the UN framework. Um, barriers, I think uh, everyone who's spoken up until now uh, has um, mentioned quite a few of them, but I'll just go over some of them that we hear uh, constantly about from local peace builders um, financing but not just enough money per se but it has to be flexible financing it's not just for activities or particular projects it has to be to build the capacity of the uh, of the local peace builders sometimes even for their own protection on the ground uh, it has to be also longer term uh, and not just be um, uh, made available for, for some short-term uh, initiatives. Um, the type of engagement, uh, a number of you have alluded to that, a partnership as opposed to a sort of uh, benefactor-client uh, relationship. Um, I think that's, uh, that's extremely uh, important, the idea of putting the locals in the, in the driver's seat. So that is from the beginning, right? Design of an initiative, the monitoring, the evaluation, and the implementation. Um, I think someone, Anita, I think you also mentioned tracking, right? Uh, we need to be able to track what we are, um, where our resources are going and what the impact is. So is it going to the right organizations? You were alluding to that. Uh, what is the actual nature of them? Um, and what kind of impact is it having on the ground? We need to constantly learn, have that learning loop. Um, and then just to go very quickly to um, um, some of the, the things that, um, we, uh, we're, we're gonna try to do in, and we already started to do in, uh, in UN. Oh, and I've got another point, sorry, in terms of barriers. One of the things we, we came out of uh, from a study that we've done, learning from our um, local peace building projects is that it's not enough just to focus on the local level. And there, Anita was also talking about national and regional level uh, networks, linking the local to the regional and to the, uh, the national and beyond. Because if you want to affect real change in real time, um, you're not going to do it just by working with the locals. It has to somehow link up elsewhere so you can get some impact at the national level. Now to the UN very quickly, quickly in steps. I just want to mention that we have uh, just had the GA pass a, unanimously a very important resolution on financing for peace building. And there is a very clear mention in there of the urgent need uh, to get flexible and long-term um, peace building uh, funding to local peace builders. How can we leverage these kinds of tools in the UN? It might seem very uh, bureaucratic and esoteric, but um, it's amazing what you can do. And I want to talk with my UN colleagues and others about how we can leverage what is a very rich um, financing for peace building resolution. Uh, secondly, within the peace building support office that I, I represent, um, we've managed to get a record number of local peace builders, including women and youth, uh, to speak at the Intergovernmental Peace Building Commission, where they are heard, they are seen, and they are having an impact. People are listening, and it's 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 um, it's really changing the way things are being done in the commission with our peace building fund. Um, we are learning constantly. We did a specific study this year on local peace building and learning from our past work, and now we're doing innovations, especially through our youth promotion and gender promotion initi initiatives, precisely trying to put the money where it's needed in the capacities and the flexibility 
and for the long term. Final thing for UN, just put it all in your um, in your to do list. We need to see how we influence the new agenda for peace that the Secretary General has been talking about. Um, I think it's a real opportunity to bring in this issue of um, empowering women, youth at the local level, and making sure that again. Uh, nothing about us without us. That should be definitely enshrined in a new agenda for peace. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have time for three more. Wow, so many more comments and yet we have time for maybe three. Um, let's go first to uh, Jose and then I'll come back to Corin. Thank you, good afternoon, everyone. Um, first of all, let me say one thing that for me is very important. I have heard today, nothing about us without us several times. And I always thought that that was something a slogan that the disability community always uses. But I'm very glad that many more people are using it. And in line with nothing about us without us, when I was thinking about how to make the international development system more effective, I was thinking of very concrete three examples. The first one is, data disaggregation. Just last week, when we were learning about the situation in Pakistan, and when we were learning how the different countries and the UN agencies were getting prepared to respond to that emergency, one of the biggest challenges we faced was we don't know how many persons with disabilities need support. We don't know where they live. We don't know what their specific needs are. So we really need to do more and the International Development Assistance should invest more in programs related to data disaggregation and persons with disabilities. The second clear example was something that it was really impactful when we heard one organization of persons with disabilities in Ukraine telling us that if they would have been consulted properly about what they needed, they would have told us or told governments and UN agencies that they need support for getting people out from institutions and being sent to safe places. What I'm saying here is meaningful consultation. If we do not invest in more meaningful consultation and if we don't create spaces that are accessible and inclusive, so persons with disabilities can be consulted, the effectiveness of any international cooperation program will definitely be lower than expected. And the last example is a very clear one that from the International Disability Alliance, the global organization that represents one than, more than 1,100 organization of persons with disabilities around the world, is we need to track funding. We need to invest in programs that will tell us not who is doing good or bad, because there is no intention to say who is doing good or bad, but how we can all do better. In summary, when we talk about nothing about us, let's allow persons with disabilities to be at the table by more meaningful consultation, more data, and more funding tracking. Thank you. Thank you. Corinne? Thank you, very rich discussion. We could continue for many hours, but thank you very much for the introductions and thank you for the discussion so far. I echo everything on the barriers around our administrative um, hurdles for all of the localized organizations in part of countries trying to apply for money. I also echo the need for Swedish, in this case, taxpayers to get the report back. But I would like to add some extra things onto this. And that is, we talk about funding, we talk about localization. In our case from Sweden, localization would mean a local organization in a region or a province in a country, not only a local organization in a country uh, being nationwide. It can be, but it doesn't have, to. it's rather a small organization very often. Um, and we need to talk about quality of funding. And with this, I of course mean that we, we try to turn more into core support and flexible long-term and multi-year funding, meaning that the power shift is actually from us to the local partners in the countries. 
This requires clear and, and um, clear uh, report back structures because we still need a report back, but it has to be reported back on the goals having been set up by the partners, by our local partners. So quality of funding has to be discussed when discussing barriers. And then I would like to, to just add to one, two more brief things. And that is the one thing is that I still think that we all have too many um, thoughts on the house. From the Swedish side, we have many centuries of, of uh, organizing ourselves in, in civil society structures. But that is not the same way as you are organizing in BRAC, but it's a fantastic organization. So we have to get rid of our own prejudices and that we have to work with all the time. It has to be said. The other thing, which is a hurdle for all of us, is the state of many nations around the world, I was about to say, but governments rather, legal frameworks. We struggle to find ways of supporting better legal frameworks for the localized organizations to be able to use their power and to use the, the, the strength that they hopefully get from working together with us. So thank you. Thank you. I unfortunately am only able to take two more hands okay. and then we'll have Peter give us closing remarks. So Scherner okay. and then Shamron. Brilliant, thank you so much. Um, I just wanna say that uh, I am a co-founder of Purposeful, which is based in Sierra Leone and funds, uh, it's a feminist organization that is committed to funding grassroots, girl-led, uh, non-binary feminist groups around the world. Now, that's in itself means that when we show up in a room, it's pretty very uh, surprising. We're based in Sierra Leone, where we were founded after the Ebola outbreak, and we have been able to build an organization in Sierra Leone with the capacity um, to engage with groups around the world. Last year alone, we funded in over 90 countries. And I'll say what we're hearing from our partners, young feminist activists around the world, is that many of the monies that are available in this room will be considered oppressive. The, the, the systems that we have that condition these ways of funding even for us at Purposeful, we're constantly learning and unlearning about which organizations even want to partner with us. We're at a stage where we have received monies from multilateral organizations, and I'll be hesitant to name names here, and private foundations, but we've now moved to a point where we're saying actively no to certain resources because they do not allow us, and I think this is important, to leave our feminist values because the entire structure and the system of the ways of funding and everything that's done do not allow us to be who we are. And I think these are important considerations. What's our partners telling us? Um, you've mentioned risk. I also want to introduce failures. Who has the privilege to fail? Like what is failure? It's, it's seen as a reserve of obviously certain people and the, the system that has been produced now is obviously had, has had its own chances of experimentation, but in this sector, you're not even allowed to fail. So even this question of risk, I think is, a, is, a, is, a, is something that we need to interrogate even further. That's the, the kinds of engagements we have with our partners. And I will say finally as well, is a commitment to revise this very, I have to say, just watching that video that we played at the beginning, there was part of it that was uncomfortable for me because it's, it's everything that I find uncomfortable about, about this discourse. It's the global South acting for you. The, 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 word I, the words I had there is, oh, please, we will prove to you. It's constant, it, it, it doesn't show any solidarity, mutual respect. It, it clearly means, so what passes for capacity is people like me who have attended Western universities, they can speak. What passes for success is people who can write the reports that you have. So it's questioning every single one of those indices. What is capacity? What is accountability, by the way? Because accountability is measured only, again, by Western standards, not how our partners we want, not how feminist allies that we work with want to define and engage what accountability is because it's accountability to each other across different institutions and value-based, not institution-based. And obviously, 
we are measuring as well what you mean by impact, whose impact and at what time, because it's long-term, flexible, really committed funding. And as you all know, we're seeing some big players emerge in this field, and those are actually providing very interesting models that challenge the status quo and, of course, of what is tenable and what is acceptable. I'm talking here, of course, of Mackenzie Scott's money that's been introduced and in coming to some organizations like ours and making a big difference in our ability to actually leave our values. I think that's worth considering. Thank you. Thank you, Chenna. And um, point taken about those um, thoughts in the video. Shemran, last comment. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'll try to be brief. Um, I'm, I'm here from BRAC. I represent BRAC International. And I'm in, a, I'm in a bit of a strange situation because BRAC in Bangladesh is both a local organization and the part of BRAC that I represent, which is BRAC International around the world, we're an INGO, right? Um, and maybe I can spend the two minutes reflecting a little bit about our experience. Um, so BRAC in Bangladesh this year is 50 years old. We're celebrating our 50th anniversary. And you know, for 50 years, um, we've proved that local organizations can not only, um, um, not only innovate, but scale and deliver high quality, large scale programming um, at much better value for money than most of our, I'm sorry to make this again, a North South thing, but most of our peers who tend to be Northern INGOs, right? Um, and even then, I think you'd be interested to learn that even today, when we look at an opportunity or a call, even uh, Mr. Par USCID calls, we think about whether it makes sense for us to go, go it alone and prime, or should we become sub to a US organization or a US contractor? Uh, one, because it allows us then to focus on the work and let somebody else take on the, the reporting requirements but also because there is a perception that our chances of winning will increase yeah. if we are subbing to a, a US-based, sometimes private contractor. Um, and, we're, and we're willing to let that contractor take off a big chunk off the top mm -hmm. while we do most of the actual programming on the ground. So that's the Bragg Bangladesh experience still, but I think we're making progress. But even today, if you look at how much USAID funding is going to save the children, care, world vision, uh, versus how much of it is going into an organization like BRAC, which is scaled in, in at least in Bangladesh as a local organization, you'd be surprised. Um, internationally, of course, very quickly, it's a different, um, it's a different kind of a situation. But the reason BRAC decided to go international about 20 years ago now when we started Afghanistan and now we're in several countries in Asia and Africa, was to take a, a, a homegrown local organization view of development and how we understand poverty and how we find solutions to poverty and how we scale that to other countries. So not to become another traditional INGO in the other countries, but to take 30 years of work at that point being a national NGO and taking that approach to other countries. Now that again is challenging, in large part because the, the way the funding works is it, it, it kind of drags us towards in, in another direction where we have to start mimicking how a typical INGO operates, right? Um, and that again is, is a challenging thing. So I'll end by saying I'm very, I'm very encouraged to hear what you're doing. Um, Talk is cheap, action is important. I'm glad that there is a lot of action taking place. I'll just say that I'm really happy that you've reworked your risk appetite, but I hope you'll also acknowledge that with increased risk also, there is a greater amount of return. And if you get this right, I think the impact that you will fund is going to go up many fold. So please continue to do that. Thank you. Thank you everyone for a lively conversation. I will now pass the floor to Peter Laharn. President and CEO of the Conrad and Hilton Foundation for closing remarks. Thanks, a very rich discussion. And obviously I drew the short straw trying to summarize uh, that and give a few next steps. But I wanted to just say some things about the stance of people in the room, targets, key elements, barriers to be lowered, 
traps to avoid, and then some next step ideas, right? In terms of stance, I think there's a lot of unanimity in the, in the, in the room. Listening, respect, learning are, are, are key here. I love the first name basis, and I think we should stay on it and take that into our other uh, conversations. Uh, the idea of not aid, uh, but resourcing is key. What the phrase that occurred to me in listening to all of you is one of uh, a basically servant fundership. You don't hear those two ideas together very much, but that's basically what's being asked of us. To remember that uh, the real action is in the funded organizations and in not in the funding organizations. Um, about targets, I, I heard a lot, uh, well, I heard actually no pushback on the idea of a 25% and a 50% target. And I think most of the organizations that are taking this seriously are setting their targets essentially there. A 25% kernel that they know they can define easily, clearly, objectively, and push on. And a broader one that is grayer, that is a, a bit uh, uh, harder to define, but that is key, I think. So I, I would just encourage everyone in the room to take those magnitudes with them and push in their own organizations and in their own networks. Uh, and philanthropy certainly is in the doghouse as well, I would say. Our, our baseline is down between 10 and 15%, and it doesn't need to be there. So we will take on that, that challenge ourselves. Um, in terms of key elements, uh, obviously meaningful conversation, consultation, not something that is decided in a capital city somewhere and imposed, uh, but built together, long-term commitments to the extent that donors can commit to long, because it will take transformation of, of all organizations here, and it's not worth it to do it for one year, two years, three years, right? Uh, transparent targets, locally led funding mechanisms, however those are, are, are designed, uh, NGO capacity building and coordination at local and at national levels. The lowering of barriers, I and mean, what I heard mostly is what funders ought to do about their own, the barriers that they've set up, of some of which, or many of which have rational origins, but not necessarily rational applications. Uh, so increase accessibility, particularly to organizations that find you scary and threatening uh, or, or, or foreign. Uh, allow people in with their own languages and you do the accommodation. Google Translate is great. It'll get you 90% of the way there for, uh, for 70 languages. Agree on results, but be flexible on the way that they are, uh, they're attained. And just think about what an RFP process looks like to a local organization what a NICRA might or might not mean to a local organization and redefine all of those with an idea of, of local use. In terms of traps to avoid, first of all, don't make commitments without an intention to change. Uh, we've, we've seen a bit of that. Um, and, and frankly, there have been some commitments that were very sincerely made, but without a sufficient uh, calculus of political complexity within the organizations making the commitments. And, I think USAID probably is one of those historically. Uh, we have to help USAID come over the finish line here and deliver on, on, on what has been pledged. Uh, second, look out for masqueraders and don't uh, masquerade anyone yourself. Uh, don't make international organizations into local and have solid enough definitions of local that it isn't a sieve that everyone can get through. Uh, don't uh, make sure that uh, one of the points raised was that you can set up a process that is so complicated that very few organizations actually end up benefiting from it. So make sure that the, uh, the aperture is wide and be on the lookout for unexpected or uh, unintended consequences. I think, um, you know, there are people in the room who work for PEPFAR, and I think PEPFAR is a, a wonderful example of getting resources closer to the, uh, to the, the grassroots. It's also... Uh, an experience where organizations grew into becoming receptacles of, of PEPFAR funding. And that wasn't necessarily, uh, that's, that's just a natural dynamic, but look out for it and help organizations maintain their integrity, their, their space. Just a few ideas on next steps. I mean, the first and most obvious one is stay in dialect, or stay in dialogue with one another and continue to challenge one another. The points of view in this room are really important to put together and not to have your conversations on the one side or the other, whether you be funders or, or civil society groups. Second, keep the, uh, the commitments that you make and encourage everyone to make at least a 25% commitment uh, and, and define what that 50% commitment might mean to them. Um, 
And then finally, I think the one that is the most important to me, looking at where the humanitarian, the World Humanitarian Summit commitment of 25% is gone, which is essentially nowhere, is assess what are the obstacles and be sure that you know how you're gonna tackle them. And I would, I would suggest there are technical obstacles and there are political obstacles. The ones that are technical have fairly straightforward solutions. And I think those are most of the ones that we heard about today, or at least the, the, the very um, clear ideas put on the table are mostly technical. But I think the largest obstacles here are political. And that can either mean national policy, it can mean the interest groups that are currently receiving that funding and what they, what they need and hope for. Um, I, I think one should not underestimate the complexity of that and really look at it together and say, you know, this is a big pie. 25% going to local organizations means there'll still be a lot of funding for other organizations who have very good uh, uses for it. But uh, don't underestimate uh, the, the importance of looking into the political. So uh, just some thoughts. Thanks. Okay. Thank you all for coming and have a good afternoon. Thank <laughs> you.